I wanted to uh, do this today. I want everybody to know that I, the system I work in right now is a conventional system. I, I'm not doing organic, but I think this has got what I'm doing has implication for both conventional growers and for organic growers. Um, I've been really working on the, on plant and insect interaction for my lifetime, and, and working on wild species of tomato. And I was really kind of frustrated that that. Uh, Nobody else was kind of picking this information up and, and going forward with it. So I was had spent some time in China. I was coming back, and I started right, sort of right at the end of my career. I was going to make one big push to try and get this material into form that somebody else could use. So that's what I've been doing the last eight or ten years or so. I guess about eight years. Uh, the two people I've got listed as co-presenters are two graduate students, and those are Iraqi students that are going to be going back to Iraq, and hopefully we'll be doing some well back reading when they get over there. So really the project objectives here, and, and we can talk about this more when, later, but I'm really trying to introduce a couple of characters from, from wild tomato and cultivated tomato. We know that they're associated with insect resistance, and one of them is a sesquiterpene hydrocarbon. It's, it's a chemical um, that's produced in trichomes um, on the plants. And then we're also trying to introduce a particular type of trichome, a type 4 trichome, and I'll show you what those look like in a little bit. So what this really is is indirect selection for arthropod resistance. So you, we'll do this. We don't know really what we're going to uncover, but, but it's moving toward insect resistance. Um, we need to uncover good reproductive fitnesses, and this has been the big bugaboo in, in trying to utilize some of the wild species, I think, not only the tomato, but a lot of other things. So I think we've got some things we can only say about that. Um, only we really want to evaluate resistance to spider mites and other arthropod species. I use spider mites because they only move in two directions, not three. They're easier to handle. But usually when you have spider mite resistance, you have resistance to other small insects like white flies. And then all the goal is to produce is to have these characters in seed form so I can hand them to somebody else and do some work. Um, so why arthropod resistance? If you if you read the literature over the years, they've talked about uh, <coughs> problems in in uh, tomato that that uh, in the field. There's really not a whole lot of insect problems, but as soon as you start moving into protected cultivation, that becomes much more of a problem. And especially in my part of the country, because of disease problems, a lot of our tomatoes are now being produced in structures of some, of some sort. That's happening all over the world as well. And then the other one is that we really don't know what the future holds, and I think we're all concerned about things like climate change and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to tell you everything you're going to see, okay? So, because uh, I think the, the outcome here is important, so I just want to tell you where we're going with all this. And right now, I've got several lines at the B3F7 that have produced levels of zingiberine that's either equal to or higher than the wild parent. And those have really good reproductive fitness. Uh, the main breeding, what I would call the main breeding population, the population has been selected for both type 4 trichomes and 4 zingiberin is a BC5F2 and it's awaiting um, screening and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that because I'm not going to have the manpower to do it. Uh, we're continuing to evaluate reproductive fitness and I'm trying to understand that better. We're looking at pollen and fruit set and seeds per fruit, as you would expect. Um, based on the results of uh, some bioassays that I'm going to show you just briefly, we have transferred resistance in, by using this indirect selection method. Um, to make this a little more accessible to breeders, because I'm, I'm right now I'm using gas chromatography to, to measure these compounds. It's possible to measure them by spectrophotometry, which spectrophotometry, which should make it a lot more accessible. It's, it's a less intense technology. It's, it's more affordable technology. It's actually quicker, too. I think it will work. It looks like it's working in our material. And interestingly, I think we're going to be able to, you can actually tell whether or not you've got a homozygote or a heterozygote of course, in zingiberin production. Um, we are looking at, um, which I'm talking about right here, the, the activity of some other compounds that occur in the wild species. 
And the reason for that is we're sort of asking the question, okay, should we think, so we've got Zingerbrain, we've got a couple other derivatives of Zingerbrain. So the question is, should we be trying to integrate those? And so we've got some answers to those questions. And lastly, because of kind of moving on, uh, I am seeking people who want to either do, look at some insect work or even some breeding work with this material. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but and this is not everything that informs the project, but some things I, I think this group and everybody should think about. Uh, this is a compendium of, of how it's from about uh, 10 years ago for how important wild species have been to 13 crops. This is tomato. So there have been 55 traits that have been transferred from wild species to to the cold of tomato. The, the, next, the next two that are important are tomato and rice. So the other thing to think of, so it's, it's been important for certain crops. And my, one of my question is, well, uh, okay, and how important could it be for other crops as well? Um, but I think one of the things to think about is, is ask the question, what's not on the list? And the, the two biggies for the U.S. corn and soybeans really aren't on the list. Corn's on there once, or maize is on there once. And, and you got to remember that, that that's the breeding community that's really large in the U.S. that kind of controls the conversation. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm actually trying to highlight, say, hey, we've got these wild species and, and they are important, at least in tomato and maybe some other crops. Um, one of the things to think about, and this is an illustration of what I talked about future changes, and I don't want to really talk about the meat of the slide other than what it illustrates. And, and the illustration is that sweet potato white fly or tobacco white fly, Bumesia, is a tropical or semi-tropical insect. It causes some damage itself. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the greenhouse white fly, but it looks similar to it. Its real damage is it spreads viruses. And one of the viruses that spreads is TYLCB on the crop, tomato crop. It's TYLCB, it stops growing. Now, like I said, it's a tropical and a semi tropical problem. In China, there's hardly any tomatoes grown in the open field anymore. They're all grown in structures. And so, even though even this area up here, which is next to North Korea, which is about 45, 40 degrees north, 45, uh, 45 degrees north, they have problems with TYLCB and white fly there because of growing things. Yeah, so these kind of things can't happen. Um, the other thing to think about relative to tomato, it's on a very narrow gene base. And it's been said that there's more genetic variation in a single fixation of alligamous tomato, that's the wild species, than there is an all cultivated tomato. Now you're all familiar with heirlooms and things like that. It's a really narrow genetic thing. So to me, it's pretty exciting to say, hey, we've got all these genes out here that really haven't been looked at in a domesticated sense and say, well, what kind of value do they have? Um, I don't want to talk about this too long, but this was published a few years ago. And the thing that was exciting for me is it was an admission by USDA that they had rediscovered plant breeding, because at least where I live, uh, we're not talking about it anymore. And in fact, my university has said there are, will be no more plant breeders at the University of Kentucky going forward. I'm concerned about that. OK. The methods that we use are really You've got to be fast when you do this, OK? Because you're looking at a lot of plants. You tear off about 20 centimeters of leaf tissue in the field from three leaflets and pretty near the top of the plant. You put those in hexane and then you can shoot that hexane on the GC to get this kind of response. And you include this is our general standard. This is our gibbering here. And you get some other compounds. These are coming from tomato for the cultivated species. And we, we've chosen this internal standard to tell us, well, if this peak is higher than this, you've probably got a pretty good plant. And then to quantitate, we actually put these leaf tissue pieces on a scanner and so we can determine how much area we extracted and you can calculate how much zingibrium per square centimeter of leaf you've got. The trigones that I was talking about that were intergressing, what I've got up here is a 
picture of a cultivated tomato. And this is the wild species down here. It's the slide of Habricades. Thank you. I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, that's five minutes left. Five minutes left. Okay. This is the type of trichome we're trying to introduce. You can look over here. There's no you know, silly trichome for the time of water. Um, you can easily see these type four trichomes on a with a with a stereo microscope. You can see them here. This is it's a, sort of out of focus. What you do is you wrap the focus up and down, and actually you see the trichomes, but you can see them. Uh, we, sorry about that. We're using modified back cross design, so pretty simple pollination in the usual fashion, and methods for. Um, well, we're looking at pollen sustainability. We measure fruit set and measure seed per fruit. So, just briefly here, this is a BC4F2. This was the result of about 550 plants. I think there's 27 on this graph. All 27 have type 4 trichome density ends and germane concentrations equal to or better than the wild parent. And then the check bars are the seed set. So you can see there's seeds for fruit, so you can see there's quite a bit of variability. But we are making, but just the fact that these things exist and they're producing seed means we're making progress. This is what, uh, what some of the fruit look like. I'm trying to move. Uh, this is this is some information about the BC3 F6, I mentioned, which is as always in jewelry. The main thing that I want you to see here is if you look at this is a recurrent parent, the yield of the recurrent parent, we had between 38 and 30, 33 and 38 fruit plants. Some of these had up to 50 fruit per plant at the time we evaluated. So there may be a, a yield increase by introducing some of these wild genes. I don't know yet. We're going to look at this a little more closely. The other thing is that the zingiberry level, and most of these things are pretty high. I did maintain some for lower levels for testing for some other purposes. Let's skip this. This is what the plants look like in the, in the fruit. You can see this is a plant that's high as a different. You can see there's a lot of fruit at the bottom. This is the top of that same plant. This is another plant that was a little bit earlier. Quite a bit of fruit, right? And that's really high as a different. If you, it's, that's a really high level as a different on that particular plant. You get some interesting things that pop out in the population. Uh, our leaf brown, I'll say, I'll just briefly say how we do this. This is, you can see this is wild festivus phytomites. We just took a little leaf and a bus and the flats, inoculated, and about seven days later, you get that. Uh, it works on plastic bars as well. <laughs> the main thing I want to point out here is that egg density, so at the end of the experiment, you count the number of eggs on the leaf and see how many there. And we've recovered egg densities that are equal to the wild parent. In this material, and then you got some other things going on down here. These also have all these have to have type four trichomes, and we've got some intermediate ones here. And, and these ones that are some more some of those BC, um, BC three F F sevens that we've got right now. Some of them have some intermediate resistance, at least in this bioassay, and it's pretty severe. I uh, mentioned earlier where you could measure the germane for the spectrophotometer. That's this that result. Um, this is the where we were talking about inter intergressing uh, some additional compounds, and that's in gibbering uh, alcohol and in gibbering epoxide. You can test those with an assay that I published quite a few years ago. You can generate some pretty good information with it. I'm rushing because of the amount of time. The main thing I want to show here is that these two, the activity of these two compounds are about fivefold better. The jury. So this to me says, okay, we need to really think about introducing those into the, into the breeding population. So the lower the number here, the better the repellency. Reproductive fitness, we see things like exerted stigma for poor, poor pollen sustainability. There's, a, there's an issue with stigma sometimes. You see this one up here, this malformed. And that's the end of my talk. And I want to thank a bunch of people. And I'll take any questions. You know, five, five, questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you have time for questions. So yes. I'm just on time. Yes, you were even a little early. Okay. Well done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of time for questions. Yes. So you see why I went over my results first, rather than at the end. Uh, what is the mode of action 
person gibbering and and is there evidence from tomato or other crops that's stable in the time with regard to the, the insects adaptation adapt okay my personal bias is that okay one is repellent right and so there's some in there or, or anastenosis if you want to get to the that and there's there's been a lot of speculation that in the literature that anastenosis is going to be more difficult to overcome than let's say anastenosis or toxicity or, or toxicity the other thing is that this is at least two factor in the sense that and i didn't really kind of talk about but on that slide where i where we did the bioassays Type 4 trichomes by themselves confer resistance. Okay, so you've got at least two factors that are involved in the resistance. So, from that standpoint, from a co evolutionary standpoint, that sort of thing, I would say it's probably less likely. It, and it, it's kind of interesting because it, theoretically, I really still don't know how to think about this. Because even in that bioassay that I talked about, the spider might control this dose by how close it walks to the stimulus. And that's the same thing that happens on the planet. That they sense these things and they walk away from it. And so, if you don't kill them, and they have an opportunity to live and to believe that there's, there probably is less, less selection pressure on that insect to evolve away from it, or evolve, or evolve a way to overcome the resistance. But I don't know. But it's a good question. I mean, and it's one that cons concerns all people, right? But it's but it's not a single gene. Um, does the single gene affect flavor at all? Yeah, or it's it's or? you if you uh, you read ginger. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. But it's not the spicy part of ginger. But it, it's a little spicy. It, it's a little kind of oily taste kind of thing. You don't have it in the tomato. Oh, that's the other the tomato. Flavor does vary some. And then the other thing is we we, we actually this last summer we were looking at antibiotics and some of them are higher than some of my things. But but the, as far as we know, the gibberine is not in the group. It's only on the leaves. I apologize, I may have missed this. Would you consider it to be broad spectrum? Or would you consider it to be broad spectrum? Would it affect more than spider -like? Yeah, uh, at least white fly and hell. We don't know about aphid. The, the wild species and those immune to insect resistance. And if you think about it, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's, a, it's an exciting thing for a plant breeder, but if you're trying to understand plant insect interaction, you can pull a bond in. Because you sort of look at, you're looking at the top of the pyramid and you, and you don't know what's underneath it. And that's one of the things that I really see about the value of the stuff I'm doing is okay, now you can look at these characters and say, well, I really don't expect it to be as resistant as the wild species. But where are we on that scale? We transferred all the resistance or not. And so that's where I see some of the real value of it. But you know, you, you do what you can to thing. And that's a problem throughout the literature, especially on these wild species. And everybody says, well, if you try to correlate this, you know, arthropod behavior with a factor, you're going to come up with type of factors. But that's not the point of fact. Okay? And then the then question is, well, how many important factors you've got? And then even those things like looking at the, the, the derivatives of the gibberine, but that's a single gene, by the way. <coughs> that, that, that change uh, could be really important. Not only do those two things have more activity, the, the alcohol and the oxide. But the other thing is when we see that at least in the wild species, the like of lines that don't have that for those that do, those that do have a, have a lot more such so terpenes on the leaves than the ones that don't have those compounds. Thank you, John. Yeah. Let's give John a hand.